There we go. Hello, Pamela. Hey, how are you doing? Good. And where are you now? I am outside of Lisbon, Portugal, in one of the suburbs. That's really cool. And you've been there. And so what are you doing there? I am here working with folks at Nucleo who work on the Global Hands-On Universe and the Galileo Teacher Training Program to find ways to integrate CosmoQuest into what they're doing to help get more people around the world using CosmoQuest. So no vacation, all work. Well, there will be some evenings spent walking castles and things like that. So it will be full work days, but it will also be full evenings, and I will probably return home in August uh, tired and thinner for all of the work, but having accomplished a lot. That is awesome. I'm getting some echo here. Hold on. There. Killed it. All right. Um, cool. So uh, if anyone has no idea what they've stumbled into, we are going to be recording a live episode of Astronomy Cast. This is our uh, weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos. So this is going to be episode 312. We're going to go into the inverse square law um, and other n non... What did you describe it? Non-linear non -linear. Rela non -linear relationships. Um which uh, sounds like a dating site or something. Are you looking for a nonlinear relationship? I don't know. Um, I, no. No, <laughs> no. Um, an exponential relationship. Uh, right, so it's going to take us about 25 minutes to record the episode, and then we will uh, wrap up and then stick around and <laughs> try to answer some questions. <laughs> Although it is uh, evening for Pamela, and she's hungry, so... Uh, it better be really snappy questions. So if you've got some questions you want to ask, you've got some posts you want to make while we're recording the show, you can make your posts on the event page. Uh, hopefully you're watching this there. Uh, if you're watching this over on YouTube, you can make a comment there. Uh, you can use Twitter. Use the hashtag AstronomyCast, although the Hangout gadget we're using doesn't track that anymore. Really? So, yeah, so I have to sort of I gotta look somewhere else now. I can monitor Twitter. Uh do. I like the Twitters. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, yeah. And then. Sorry for the motion, everyone. <laughs> you're actually not moving, to, from my perspective, but. Okay. Um, it has image stabilization built in, because yeah, it's moving. <laughs> there. Okay. I'm done typing. You're done. We're stable again. <laughs> That's weird. Is the image stabilization just like? paused you entirely. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. Um, okay, great. So is there anything you wanted to announce, mention, exclaim, complain? Don't eat in kebab pizzerias in Finland? Bad, bad tummy. Yeah, all right. I think we'll, we'll save that from the episode. Okay. Uh, okay, great. Well, I'm uh, I'm gonna press record. Okay, I should do the same thing, shouldn't I? You know, it's <laughs> one of those things that we do maybe sometimes. Okay, I have pressed record. It is recording. The levels look okay. I am also recording. All right. Oh, I need my intro in front of me here. Hold on, hold on. Now I'm the one holding Sorry, this. Sorry, Preston. And Preston, good luck working on your thesis. You have all of our hopes and cheers and chocolate wishes going towards you. Aww. All right, here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 312 for Monday, June 24th, 2013. The Inverse Square Law and Other Strangeness. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos. We help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm almost as far as we've ever been apart doing an astronomy cast this week. Last week was further, but this week I'm in Lisbon while you're in Vancouver, so we're spanning the continents here. We could drill a hole right through the Earth. No. And, no. No, I think I'd be in the uh, in the Indian Ocean if I drilled a hole through the Earth. Yeah, I I don't know where I'd come out. Really? Um, 
You should figure that out. There's a, I think there's a website you can go and check out that is like your, <laughs> your anti antipode of on the earth to find out where where it would be. Uh, great. So yeah, so you're in Portugal, continuing your um, your European uh, vacation work. No. Yeah, I know it's no. not, totally not a not a vacation. You're working. Yeah, my my European inflict Cosmo quest on people in other countries. All right. So the European tour, the Cosmo quest European tour. Yes, that'll agree with. All right, cool. Uh, and just, I want to make one quick little promotion and mention, which is that every Sunday night, uh, we connect a bunch of telescopes into a live Google Plus Hangout and show you the night sky uh, live in real time. We'll show you planets. We'll show you deep sky objects, clusters, the moon, the sun sometimes. It's, a, it's fun times. And we often will bring in PhD astronomers to explain this stuff. So if, you, if, you're cloud, if you, you know, you've got cloudy skies and you don't know what to do with your Sunday evening, uh, join us on, on Google+. So we do it whenever it gets dark on the West Coast. Right now it's summertime, so that's you know, 9 p.m. Uh, Pacific Daylight Time and even later <laughs> in the East. But it'll get, it'll get better in the, in the summer. So all right. It'll so, get better in the winter. It get better in the winter. It gets for you know, north. For it'll north. It'll get That's better right. in the southern summer. That's right. Uh, all right. So, why don't we have insects the size of horses? Why do bubbles form spheres? Why does it take so much energy to broadcast to every single star in the universe? Let's take a look at some nonlinear mathematical relationships and see how they impact your day to day life. All right. Now, you threw this topic on the list. <laughs> you had a plan and uh, you know I this is not my topic and so I am going to just <laughs> grill you to get to the bottom of this. Uh, but uh, right so so let's sort of you know, sort of set the stage here. When you're talking about nonlinear relationships, what are you talking about? Um so so most of the time we are used to thinking of things that if you double them, you end up with four. If you triple them, you end up with with nine. So so the numbers in that in that case, those that's not linear. Linear is if you increase this one by one, this one increases by one. You increase this one by two, this one goes up by two. So if you think about the um, difference between Johnny and Sally's ages, it it will always be the same because they grow up at the same rate and so the separation stays the same and if you do a plot of Johnny's age versus Sally's age there'll be a line that's straight. And this is really the only the kind of, of mathematical concept that our poor human brains are really able to rock in general, yes. You know, when you think about yeah. it. You know what I mean? I mean that, that we evolved, you know, on the savanna and, you know, if there's one more lion, we should bring one more hunter, right? And and it, in, in school, we all learn the whole Y equals MX plus B. There might be a slope to the line, but it's still a line. So it may be that you add one here and you add two thirds here. If you add two here, you add four thirds here, but it's still a linear relationship. So that that's what we're used to is is that straight line when you put the things on the two axes. Right. Okay. And so, but I mean, the universe sure doesn't like to play by the rules and uh, doesn't like to play by our pathetic human concepts. It, uh, you know, makes its own rules. So, so then what are the other kinds of n the nonlinear relationships that can be out there? Well, so they, they basically come in polynomial form. This is where if I have my X value over here, so like how fast my car is going, versus how much gas goes into it. Um, the gas going into it hopefully isn't a power law, but you can imagine that it's y squared, y cubed, y to the four thirds. Anytime x equals y to the something that's a power, that's a power law. Right, and I, your, I think your gas analogy is a great one, right? Because you have the situation that the the harder you push down on the pedal, the you're not just using, you know, more fuel. You're using, you know, in many cases, you know, the engine is actually going to require a multiplier of the fuel. 
Right. You know, if and you that's your... because the friction goes up, the heat goes up, the it gets more difficult to accelerate for mechanical reasons. Yeah. Yeah, and harder. To, yeah, exactly. That that friction harder to push through the air resistance as you're driving down the highway, until it becomes just like a brick wall of air. Right. Right. Yeah. So then the other class of relationships that we tend to have are logarithmic relationships. Uh, so these are things that are powers of 10 or inverse powers of 10, which is where you get a logarithm, basically. Um, inverse isn't quite the right, right way to think of it, but it's a shorthand. And this so, is where you've kind of pulled into my background, which is computer science, right? We deal with the logarithmic scales all the time. When you, right. you, know, when you search or sort an algorithm, in, you know, if you're going to sort a bunch of numbers, uh, that actually follows a logarithmic scale. So it's, you know, you can sort uh, a million numbers, you know, it's not a million times as hard as to sort, you know, a one number or a thousand numbers, right? Every time you go up, it actually follows this logarithmic curve. So it's, so it doesn't, what is it, doubles every 10? How does, how does the logarithmic function work? Uh, so, so with, with, 10 is a, so 1 is to 0, 2, sorry, 0 is to 1, 1 is to 10, 2 is to 100, 3 is to 1,000. Right, right. And so the, the, the point is, is that the, you know, it's a way that if your, your numbers are going up in stupid amounts, you can yeah. kind of flatten the curve down and show it in a, in a much sort of reasonable way, as opposed to just this, this line that just, just goes straight up. Yes, exactly. Bring it down and, and show it in a little bit more of a reasonable way. And, and what's interesting is how many biological things, or at least the two senses of most importance that we have, our, our ability to see and our ability to hear, both work on logarithmic scales. The sounds around us vary by powers of 10, not by linear relationships. So when you turn your dial up to 11, it's not 11 times louder, it's, it's tens and tens and tens of times louder. Right, and so it gets a lot louder a lot more quickly. But at the same time, you've got this other problem in, in the case of that sound, right, which is that the sound trying to expand outward from the speakers is hitting, I guess, what we call the inverse square law, right? Right, so, so here's where we start to get into where do these things matter. Yes. And, and an inverse square law is a power law. It's just a power law with a negative sign in it. Um, so it, if you have something that's radiating out, it, it has to basically radiate, radiate out over an entire surface. Uh, sound coming out of a speaker, it's not laser beamed to your ear with all the power from the speaker focusing the sound on your eardrum. Instead, it's radiating around away in a sphere, and so the energy gets spread out over the surface of the sphere, and for every distance that it goes, the area proportionally goes up by the square. So take the energy, divide it by the area, and if the area is going up by the square, that means the energy, the energy per small area on that surface is going down by the square. All right, now let's bring it home to astronomy, which is, I think, you know, I think what people are, are hoping to hear. Uh, so, <laughs> so give us some examples then in astronomy where we deal with this with this power law because I mean it feels very mathy and I know a lot of people are starting you know their eyes start to glaze over with the math but but this is core to a right. lot of the calculations that astronomers have to do with gravity and light and brightness and luminosity and sound and earthquakes and all this kinds of stuff it all follows this exact same system right I, I'd argue that earthquakes are probably more planetary science than astronomy but let, let's let's tie it back planetary down to geologists, physics. sure physics, astronomy, space science. So, so the most fundamental place that we worry about it in astronomy is light as it radiates away from a star has to fill this entire sphere of space um, and fill the surface, not fill the inside. You can have a flash of light and that's a shell that radiates away. So the apparent brightness of a star decreases by that power law, that square the distance squared um, 
as you get further and further away. So if I double my distance to a star, the star will appear four times fainter. If I triple my distance to a star, it will appear nine times fainter. And so things get faint fast. And that's problematic when you're trying to look at things far away, uh, just because it is this ever-increasing thing that you're dealing with. Yeah, I mean, when we think about the stars that we can see out in the sky at night, most of those stars are bright, like really bright stars, because in many cases they're, they're mostly just far away. You know, things like Betelgeuse and Rigel and... You know, they're just big, bright stars, and that's what it takes to put out that much energy over such great distances. And, and this is that square law, again, working in a different way. When you look at the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, the color magnitude diagram that we talked about in a past episode, you see that the, the brightest stars are also physically the biggest stars, and this is because they have more surface area for the light to come out of. Our own sun in the future, it's going to cool down, it's going to become colder, but it's also going to become much, much larger. And that much, much larger star is going to be significantly more luminous and it'll be visible from a much bigger distance. So bigger stars with more surface area, surface area goes as the square of the radius of the star, so you double the size of a star you multiply by four the surface area that's giving off light and you end up with a much brighter star. There's other factors that have to do with temperature and stuff like that, but the basic idea holds. Right, and people don't realize, like Betelgeuse, even though it's a gigantic star, you know, would envelop Jupiter, it's actually cooler than the sun, the yeah. surface. Yeah, it, it would still kill you quite effectively. Oh, sure. But... Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, okay, so so that's a good example, right? And I think that exact same thing, it you know, sort of comes back to this concept of searching for extraterrestrials, right? That if you were attempting to broadcast a signal out into space, to reach any distance, you're going to require a ton of power. Right, and, and this is one of those things, if you've ever walked too far away from your Wi-Fi antenna at home, you know how quickly you go from five bars to zero on your laptop. Well, think about how quickly you go from detectable to not detectable as you move away from the planet Earth. Yeah, we sent episodes of I Love Lucy. Yes, we sent the opening games in, in the opening of the games in Germany from the Olympics with Hitler into outer space. But those signals are so amazingly weak that uh, they're, they're going to be very quickly imperceptible against the background noise of the universe. Uh, so trying to detect aliens from radio signals, the way we're o the only way we could probably ever succeed is if they were purposely beaming a message into space and we just happened to look the right place at the exact right time. So you actually think that the power requirements are so high that it would take an alien beaming a, a signal directly at us? Like it would require... I mean, I guess when For, you think about it, like there are stars, there are red dwarf stars that are... 10 year, light years away from us that you require, you know, a really powerful telescope to even discern them. Right. And, and that's the whole and, power of a star. Right. So how are we going to pick up the accidentally leaked into the atmosphere television signals? Um, I mean, at, at best, we might pick up the type of signal that's being sent to one of their own spacecraft somewhere else in their solar system. But even then, we just use enough energy for Voyager to pick it up when we send me messages to Voyager. We're not trying to reach Alpha Centauri or anything else out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so then, now what about gravity? How does gravity sort of follow a similar role? Well, gravity falls, gravity goes um, as, as the radius of the planet squared, but inversely again. So if you have a planet of a given mass, as that mass is held constant, so you assume the same mass all the time, and you make the planet bigger and bigger and bigger, the gravity you feel while standing on its surface goes down as the square of that radius again. So it works the same way as light.
-hmm. So just like the light gets, you, you double the radius, the light goes down by a fourth, you double the radius of the planet, a gravity goes down by a fourth. Now the thing is, you're fundamentally changing a planet when you take a rocky planet and you try and blow it up with some unknown weightless nothing. Um, but but at the same time, one interesting thing about this is you can end up with different combinations of mass and, and radius that lead to the same surface gravity. So if you try to stand on the surface of Saturn, which is so not dense it would float on water, it has almost the same surface gravity as Earth. So you would weigh almost the same amount on the surface of Saturn. So even though Saturn's this monstrously huge planet, because its mass is spread out over such a large volume, and that's the key. Volume goes up as a power of three. So this is the, the insects the size of horses don't exist example you tried to give at the beginning. Um, a, if I have a sphere of material and I double its radius, its surface area goes up by a factor of four, and its volume goes up by a factor of eight, which is the cube of that two. So two times two times two is eight. So you're getting massive very quickly. This is the reason that someone who's twice as tall um, may weigh eight times as much, which is kind of creepy to think about. Right. Well, I mean, the uh, we talk about those super Earths sometimes. You know how the, how a planet has been found with twice the mass of the Earth, and you would think that you know if you were standing on the surface, as you mentioned before, that you would experience twice the gravity. But actually, you would you know it all just depends on the size of it correspondingly. Right? Yeah, is it, and is we're it a still bigger planet? Is it a smaller planet? Out. Yeah, because we only get those measurements through the radial, either the radial velocity, so we only can detect their mass. We can't detect their size. Exactly. Yeah. Um, right. So I, I definitely want to talk about those, those, that bug example here. Right. So you, so as your bug increases in volume, right, in size, yes. in volume, it has to be correspondingly stronger. And that's what you're and making. Go ahead. And and this is where the legs very quickly no longer become strong enough to hold it up. If you look at the radius of of the legs on a bug, they they have these hair sized legs until you start looking at tarantulas, which finally have legs more like matchsticks or French fries. And those little tiny legs are able to hold up the bugs because they're small. They don't have that much volume. They don't have to hold that much stuff inside of them. Um, as you start to get to birds, which are another very lightweight animal, you see that the legs get a little bit bigger. As you start to get to small mammals, you have legs that are proportionately a little bit bigger compared to the body. Humans, next. But then when you get to elephants, you suddenly have these, compared to the size of the body, these m massively large radius legs. And that increase in the radius of the skeletal bones in the legs is needed to support um, that, tr that power of three increase in the volume as the animals get bigger and bigger and bigger. Right, dinosaurs and so on. I, the uh, was it the California redwoods are like are pretty much at the largest size you can get for trees. Just you know that they can't pull water anymore up to the yeah. top. If you got any bigger, they just you know the hydrostatic system they use to bring water out just you know just doesn't work anymore. And there's no yeah. sort of bigger possible tree. So nature has tested that. And the other example I used in my introduction, right, with a balloon. I love the thing I love about a balloon or like a like a bubble when you blow a bubble is you're you're seeing the math made for you right there. You know, you get this bubble, you know what the radius of the bubble is because you can see it and you can see the size and surface area and the volume of the bubble and it's following this exact same rules. It's trying to match its volume versus its surface area to the minimum size. Right. So so the most stuff that you can fit within a given surface area is fit inside of a sphere. Something like a pyramid is an extremely um, inefficient shape, 
where where the uh, surface amount of surface area you have is uh, greater than necessary to contain the volume. So what are some other situations in space maybe, you know, in astronomy where we're going to see the same relationship play out? You know, what do astronomers need to deal with or even spacecraft uh, engineers need to deal with as they're sending probes out to other places to be able to communicate with them to, you know, some of their trajectories, some of the gravitational flybys, things like that? Well, as we look at all of the different orbital mechanics equations, there's always a to the power of the square root, there's a cube, a square. So just looking at, at Kepler's equations, we have uh, the period, uh, the amount of time that it takes an object to go around its central mass squared is proportional to um, it's a semi-major axis distance. You take the ellipse, you cut it in half on the long side, you measure that length, is, is equivalent to that semi-major axis cubed. So here you have one thing that's squared related to something else that's cubed, now plot. And uh, so you end up with some fabulous curves. And what, what's awesome is if you're ever digging through an old professor's drawers, finding the fancy curve devices they had to try and draw all of these old plots back in the days when you had to turn in hand-drawn plots to journals. Really? Yeah, yeah. I, what did one of these things look like? Well, they, they just have on them the various here's a square, here's a a cube and and so they have these tightening cubes that represent the tightening curves rather that represent the different mathematical relationships so you found the part that you needed and fitted it to the points on your paper like a spirograph kind of no the spirographs were the things you did this with you you had the the circle that you put inside the other circle with a gear and you made flowers basically no this was this was like a stencil that you might use to draw circles today, except part of the stencil was it had these curves, and then you'd have to figure out where on this tightening curve the particular curve you needed happened to fall. It's like finding an, uh, you know, an old slide rule. Yeah, yeah. Do you know how to use the slide rule? No, no clue. Someone no cl showed me once when I was in the 11th grade, and I knew how to do it for about a week and then forgot. I think another good example of this situation is, you know, for example, people always talk about the planets, you know, astrology, and they talk about how the planets are, are aligning and it's going to have some nonsense effect on you. But the reality is that, you know, you're experiencing a, you know, a zillion, I believe is the right math, times more from just the gravity of the, of the Earth and the moon, you know, but even that's well, not very much. You're feeling more gravity from mountains, right? Because the distance and and the the more important the more important thing is if you calculate the mass of a semi truck driving past you, um, or not the mass if you calculate the gravitational pull of an average massed semi truck driving past you, its pull on you as it drives past is going to be greater than that of any of the planets outside of Earth. Yeah. So, if unless you're plotting the movements of the local fleet of shipping trucks and trains, um, I don't think you can correctly compensate for, for their effects relative to all of the other planets. Yeah, it's like the tides, right? The, the majority of the tides comes from the moon, not the sun, even though the moon is, you know, it's just because the moon is closer, even though the sun is, yeah. has, has much, much more mass than the moon. It's just that the moon is closer, and so we experience yeah. more gravitational effect from it. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Pamela. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Right. Stop. Save. Okay. Don't go anywhere. I'm trying not to, although I may be occasionally rotating my screen. Not you. I'm talking about the people who are watching this. Okay. Clearly, I'm tired and hungry. <laughs> tired and hungry. Yeah. Too bad. Um, all right, let me see. So uh, Michael Jobin says, when you co-phase two 5 dB antennas, you don't get 10 dB, you get uh, 7.5 dB. So I think that's a great example. Yeah. Um, 
Welcome to your Pamela. Could you guys do an episode about Jupiter's moon Callisto and Ganymede? Maybe adding some information on the most recent plans of ESA and NASA to send probes and missions. So we did an episode about Jupiter's moons. Uh, this sort of this comes from Callan Dorian. Uh, we did an episode about Jupiter's moons in the 50s somewhere, 50s, 5, 56, I think. We Not the 1950s, the 50s. In the 19, in the 1950s, we've been doing this show for that long. In the 1950s, we did an episode uh, about the uh, yeah the Cold War. No, uh, sorry, about uh, about Jupiter's moons, and we put a lot of effort into the Jovian moons. We we tend not to talk about future missions because they just get canceled and explode and explode and so that russian rocket was kind of amazing like we're st you keep punting the curiosity episode just because i'm waiting know, for science returns and they're starting to get them yeah yeah so so that's it so just like this is pamela's level of conservatism now i am glad to do episodes about all kinds of speculative uh, nonsense, but Pamela's the one who kind of, you know, it's keeps supposed me to be leashed. a facts based facts. show. Exactly, and and for example, like we haven't done an episode on on James Webb, and you know we're just gonna wait till it launches and does its thing. We haven't done an episode on New Horizons yet. And unfurls. And unfurls yeah. its beautiful, uh, yeah, telescope. And yeah, we haven't done an episode about New Horizons yet. Same thing, you know. We're waiting. Boy, as soon as it crosses Pluto in 2015, we will be all over that. So, I can't wait to see pictures of Pluto. It's gonna be so great. We, we, you know, we in the space journalism world, we have to use the same images of. Pluto again and again and again. There's like four images of Pluto, and we just keep mm -hmm. recycling them. I cannot wait. You know, there's a the whole rest of the universe you can write articles on. Yeah, but if I'm going to have to write an article on Pluto, I'm going to need that image. You can use the image of the telescope that was studying Pluto. Then what? Right? I'm just saying. I'm saying we just we just keep running out. So. Um, Let's see. Any more questions? Uh, oh, uh, Andrew Planet says, find your antipode uh, at antipoder.com. So, antipoder.com. And I'm going to do it right now. I'm pretty sure it's in the Indian Ocean. So, let me okay. see. Okay. I'm going to potentially jiggle my screen again. Okay. Let me see. It's A N T I P O D. Yeah, A N T I P O D R. Yeah, so I am the closest landmass for me in Courtney, British Columbia, is like some little island, the French Southern and Antarctic lands. So I'm way south of, just north of Antarctica, sort of south of Madagascar, but way below Africa. So I am, I am not going to visit there. Mine is in New Zealand. I'm kind of good with that. From home, but what about now when you're in Portugal? Uh, no, 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 from Lisbon. It's in New Zealand. Oh, okay. I should do right. home. I should do home. Yeah. Hope you're all doing this as well. Uh, you're all yeah, in the my, Indian Ocean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> right. we can see each other in the Indian Ocean. Yeah. <laughs> Separated by, you know, 4,000 miles. Um, cool. Well, that's a great tool. That's awesome. I'm going to... I'm going to... Share that somewhere. Twitter. I don't know what is this Twitter you speak of. Um, <laughs> Randy eight one one eight says I'm more excited to see Ceres in 2015 than Pluto. Me too. Oh, don't I make agree. me choose. Don't make me choose. I I cannot wait to see Ceres. Like I'm totally stoked to see Ceres more than Vesta, right? Because I mean this is on the other side of the frost line. What are yeah. we going to see? This is going to be neat because we knew Vesta was just going to be a big you know, another spot, well, right? And, a pounded and the thing up is, asteroid. Ceres has enough gravity that you can almost imagine, like, eventually humans walking around on it happily. Not like, I mean, no atmosphere or anything, but it's moon quality, not too hard to get to in the grand scheme of things. Let's go hang out. And, um, yeah, I'm excited about Ceres. I don't see us going to Pluto. It's, it's, it's an iceberg in the outer solar system.
Uh, Graham Stickings uh, has a great suggestion for an episode, actually. These mathematical relationships prove Professor Marcus de Sotoy's point that maths is the queen of the sciences. Maybe you could do something on values that occur in nature, like pi, e, and root minus one. And I think Didn't we do something like that? We did an episode on some fundamental numbers, like omega and and okay. and things like that, but we haven't done sort of some of the other natural. I don't yeah. know. We should take another crack at it. I think I think it's a great idea for a. For and me. and for those of you who don't already know about it, there's a fabulous video series called Sixty Symbols that does this in huge detail. So yeah. we're not going to replicate what they did because we can't. It, no. It's amazing. Yeah. And um, they're way beyond we, sixty. I think at this point they've. Yeah. Yeah. Really, yeah so. Um, fantastic. Yeah. Check that on YouTube. It's called Sixty Signals. Yeah. Um, cool. Symbols. 60, 60 symbols. symbols, yeah. It would be cool if we had 60 sing signals from somewhere. From space. Space. Okay. Uh, well, I think I've got... That's all the questions that I'm seeing. Okay. Um, and I know that you're sleepy, so why don't we, uh, why don't we wrap this up? And um, we will be doing this again next week, although the week after is still questionable, so we may hide an episode in a random moment. And in a random place. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, it'll definitely be in Lisbon. I'm not going to do wild podcasts from Greece. Are you going to be in Greece next? Yeah. Wow. Okay. That's <laughs> awesome. All right, cool. So the next thing that is happening... Uh... There will be a pre-recorded learning space going up on Wednesday. Okay. And then we're going to do the weekly space hangout on Friday. Yep. At noon. So, so we do our roundup of all the big space news that happened this week with a whole pile of space journalists. So join us. It's fun. Uh, and then the uh, virtual star party on Sunday night. So, All right. Well, thanks, Pamela. Good. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Really appreciate it. And uh, we will see you all next time. Okay. Sounds good. Oh, <laughs> the bong.